even within the university itself, a university press book is what is technically called a positional good. Its value lies not in how much money one can get for it, but in the rankings it can secure for its author and its publisher. And that quality of positional good extends to the remote purchaser, purchaser who by owning it participates in the university's own, uh, own positioning. The last time I spoke about books was at Michigan, and I, I did it all, all out of markets in a book I'd published. Um, that was taking apart the idea of capital D, capital M market by looking at how markets actually function as a matter of particular communities. And uh, actually, there's a wonderful chapter in it on uh, show dogs, the market in show dogs, or show dogs as a market, and comparing that to literary scholarship. You know, <laughs> a show dog is a positional, it's a, a positional good. Um, it, you can't make a lot of money off it, but if you've got the best dog, you can be really proud of having the best dog. And the same true of if you've got the, uh, well, as Columbia does, an English professor who was just tenured and won the Rene Wellick Award, which is the, the biggest complete award in the country last year. But back to the question of what one is paying for in paying for a university press. For one thing, one's paying for people like me. I'm an acquiring editor. This means my job is to recognize value and create reputations to assess, or better, to orchestrate the assessment of. Um, we are very much a matter of networks um, in, in editing. The value of scholarly work and to create the reputation of a university press. From the institutional angle, that is, from the viewpoint of creating the reputation of a press, this is a matter of what I call constellation. I arrange for books to be accepted for publication and to be seen together in ways that bring out the value of each in relationship to others, and one hopes make each seem more than it would be on its own. What I'm going to try to do here is actually um, distinguish between uh, what I would call the digitized book, which is what Google is all about, the whole Google Library project, the Google Book Search program, that's all what I would call the digitization of existing print books. Um, and contrast that with what I will call, the, uh, for convenience, the digital book. And the digital book is, I think, perhaps best exemplified by a project that was based here right at Columbia, and that's uh, Gutenberg E. And I thought it might be appropriate today to actually talk about that project um, and to really distinguish it from the, the economics of the, the digitized book, and contrasting it with the economics of the digital book. Because I think the digital book is, in interesting ways, um, the potential future of, the, of publishing scholarly monographs, but it involves huge challenges, um, as the Gutenberg E project discovered. Um, but, and I, I've actually written an article about this, which will appear in the January, February issue of Against the Grain. I haven't finished it all yet, but I'll kind of give you a preview of that. Um, and what I'm integrating into it, uh, I, I started out with the, uh, the Mellon Report, annual report, which came out in July, where Don Waters and a colleague of his there um, talked about various of the Mellon projects. And uh, what they said about the Gutenberg E project um, disturbed me because they talked about it in terms of mostly a failure in con contrast with uh, JSTOR, which is you know the, the jewel in the crown of, of the Mellon Foundation's project. And uh, secondarily, also um, well thought of there is, is Project Muse. Of course, both of those were focused on journals. And then they have the Gutenberg E project focused on books, which they considered more or less, you know, only a modest success at best. And part of the reason for that is that they, the, the chief criterion which they, uh, by which they judged it in that Mellon report is uh, economic sustainability. Well, it happens that I was on the, the um, committee that uh, advised Robert Darton about setting up this um, project in the first place. So what I've done in a post-mortem on the Gutenberg E project is to go back and look at what those of us talked about before the project ever got off the ground. And the interesting thing from my point of view, when I went back and looked at the notes uh, about what our advisory group had uh, told Darton about this, there, there was real uh, uniform agreement of that this was not going to be economically sustainable that you know, there's, there's no way in which um, th this kind of process would be, I mean, Mellon actually thought that this was one way of experimenting to see if um, books could be published more cheaply online than in print. Uh, but those of us who knew enough about what went into producing these, these very high level fancy um, electronic texts realized that the costs involved in there went far beyond what it would cost to, to publish a traditional print book. 
one of the lessons learned here is that the production of these works is truly a collaborative effort. It's not the single scholar going off and just producing the work. The, the scholar involved in these projects, they, in fact, they had to extra melon from, money from Mellon in order to set up workshops because the um, scholars, once they got the $20,000, didn't know quite what to do, I mean, even how to begin. So uh, Columbia actually had workshops with the technologists, the editors, and the, the scholars all involved. And it turns out that the production of these books involved that kind of collaboration throughout the entire process, which meant, of course, that it was a very expensive process, <laughs> not just involving a single scholar, but an entire team producing each of these books. And, um, and, and, and you know, that, that really is, is kind of at the core of why these books are so expensive to publish. even as libraries are looking at their budgets and portioning certain amount to serial publications, certain amount to electronics, certain amounts to print monographed. It's, it's always been a balancing act or sometimes a competing act. And I think that we're seeing that still. The complication now is we have a whole new sort of format and world to be acquiring, whether it's digital back files of journal runs or whether it's uh, current electronic books. And so that, I think, is having an impact on um, how we are able to keep up as libraries in supporting the monograph in our collections. I think that, too, my observations um, have led me to believe that uh, models for pricing coming from our, our publishers have been fairly um, known in the print world, but these models for pricing haven't always been uh, quite as understandable to us in the electronic world. So if uh, material is going to be born digital or be that ideal digital book, not a digitized version of a print book, uh, I think we have to see where those price models are going to take us and how we will be able to continue to afford to add those to the collection and keep affording to add print materials to the collection that we see as valuable. So th these were my brief um, observations based on the, the library view of where the monograph is right now. And I would say that... Um, within the humanities and history realm, uh, there, again, is still an expectation that this material will be in libraries. I think there's still an expectation that publishers will be out there uh, looking for quality material to bring to the scholarly community. I think at the same time, there is an interest in moving into the area of the true digital book, something that takes advantage of all of the features and technology that's there. Uh, a question that, that I would raise as we do this is how do you maintain the life of that work over time? Because you can create something in a digital form that needs to survive. And how do you do that when the platforms change and the technology changes? The, the advantage of uh, a physical book has been that we've done a pretty good job at preserving it, at least for a long enough time, and making it something that can last and can be used in the future. I think whether it's a digitized version of a print book or a true digital book, we don't have all those answers yet. We don't have them in the preservation world. We don't even have them in the uh, interactive world. How will we make sure those links are still there or that multimedia still plays or that interactivity is, is going to uh, continue?